Welcome. For all of you who are joining us today, thank you so much. It's truly a pleasure and a privilege to have these webinars in our series. This is the 16th that we are doing in healthcare innovation trends from the trenches. My guest today is Donald Belfew from Healthcare Strategist, a healthcare strategist and director at NBBJ. I'm Andy Simon, and I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about myself and this webinar series. I'm a corporate anthropologist. I specialize in working with organizations that need or want to change. Donald and I met almost by chance, and he is a, a fascinating individual, author of the Stratix Crossroad, where healthcare strategy and execution meet. His blog is dedicated to advancing healthcare strategy as it adapts to the fast pace of change in the new era of healthcare reform. And having listened to him go through his webinar, I think you're going to find this a very interesting complement to the others in the series. Let me tell you a little bit about the series. As an anthropologist, I was watching things going on in the field that I thought was very interesting, very interesting to share. And I was sharing them with my colleagues, often other consultants working in healthcare. And they too said, isn't it a shame that we can't find an easy way to tell people what we see taking place as healthcare institutions and consumers are adapting to the ch changing healthcare environment. So this is a very interesting time for us to bring the talent to you so you can hear what's happening and apply it appropriately to your own institution. There are some institutions to set the stage here. First of all, it takes time for new to transform the existing. I remember several years ago at a conference, a nurse said to me, well, it takes doctors 15 years to take on evidence-based medicine. And then somebody else said, no, it's down to 13 years. And then someone else said, ah, they're getting better, it's 10 years. And then I had a doctor tell me he was unsure if the evidence was really evidence-based medicine. So it was sort of interesting. The second thing is that in 1995, people said the internet would kill print newspapers. But the industry became more and more profitable for another decade and, and then it all fell to pieces. And we're doing research for another a client in other industries about the slow adoption of new technology. And it was sort of interesting. This one is my third here, is people said electronic books and Amazon.com would kill the brick and mortar bookstore industry, but it kept chucking along for another 15 years before borders finally imploded in 2011. So this becomes sort of a question as you're listening to Donald talk about the possibilities that are coming, what's going to actually happen to the hospital. And he's divided the talk in two parts. The first, he'll be talking about all the new robots and artificial intelligence and new things coming. And the second part is about what will happen in the hospital of the future. My a little market evolution graph here, I use often as we think about these innovations and trends from the trenches. Darwin, it's not the strongest or the smartest that thrive, it's the most adaptive. And as we work with our clients, the real question is, how do we know benchmarking is no longer a good basis for thinking about what we should do? Who's leading in the innovations that are coming? And how do we know how to adopt them and adapt them best to our own institution? So now let me turn this over to Donald, and please, Donald, take it from here. Well, thank you, Andy, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Your introduction was spot on uh, because we are talking about changes and maybe changes that will happen slower, changes that will happen more rapidly. Uh, it's an area that is advancing rapidly, and there are new innovations and technologies coming out almost every week. So what I'll be showing and discussing is meant to be indicative rather than comprehensive. And I do want to say that the views expressed here are mine and not necessarily those of NBBJ. So driving forces, what's, what's happening out there that is causing all these changes to occur? One of the most fundamental, of course, is growing costs. This chart from CMS shows that national health expenditures were $2.9 in 2013 on $9,255 per person and accounted for 17.4% of gross domestic domestic product. CMS projects that to grow to 19.3% in 2023. Hospital expenditures accounted for $937 billion in 2013 and 32% share of NHE. 
Looking out 10 years, if total NHE growth occurs as CMS expects and hospitals maintain this year, hospitals will grow to 1.7 trillion of total NHE. Now, a lot of people are working very hard at slowing the rate of growth for hospital expenditures, but whether we end up in 2023 with 1.3, 1.5, or 1.7 trillion is probably moot. Hospital care is just too costly and not reliable enough for the product we get. For those of us who have employee-based insurance, the amount we pay for out-of-pocket costs for premiums and deductibles as a share of our income is rising and is now at 9.6% nationally because employees are shifting the cost of care to us to keep their costs down. You can see from this Commonwealth Fund chart that nationally the percent of out-of-pocket costs rose from 5.3% to 9.6% share of median family income. If you were making $100,000, that is $10,000 coming out of your pocket if you used all your deductibles and co-pays. And if you are spending up to your copay and deductible limits, you're probably cutting back on other things. On the other hand, many people are avoiding using health care because they can't afford the copays and deductibles or the seeking alternatives that are cheaper. A lot of product development is going to capturing this cash client along with developing cheaper insurance policies. And that means hospitals have to change considerably to reduce costs. Developing cheaper healthcare requires technologies that enable it to happen. Here are five that play some part in all the tech I will be discussing. Cheap parallel computation started to evolve in the 2000s and allows computers to perform related calculations at the same time, compressing what could have taken several weeks into a day or less, and it continues to speed up. This gives us the ability to crunch big data. We collect massive amounts of data everywhere, and healthcare is one of the biggest generators of data. Add to that all the data that will come from wearable and implantable sensors, and a new era is upon us. To take advantage of this, data scientists are creating better algorithms. Deep learning algorithms and their use has accelerated greatly since being tied to heavy parallel processing systems, and it is an essential component of all current and future machine intelligence, and it will get better and better. Imaging continues to expand and innovate. This is important because we use images to plan and guide surgeries. As this gets better, surgical robots will get better. And stay tuned for 4D ultrasound holograms, MRI activated and guided surgical tools, along with laser spectroscopy and electromagnetic radiation that can image abnormal cells at the molecular level. Expect advances in haptic feedback or the ability to feel pressure, heat, and other sensations Feel is key for any surgeon, and it will be key to any robot operating on soft tissue. For me, the most important driving force is simply this. We are reaching our human limits to improve. This is what Arnold Milstein, a professor of medicine at Stanford, who directs the Clinical Excellence Research Center, told a small audience at a conference I attended last year. If you think about this at all, our improvement efforts have only been getting incremental changes in productivity, efficiency, and quality despite everyone's best efforts, and it's not enough to get where we need to go. We are finally realizing that we need to enlist the same technologies that other industries have used to make the kinds of changes in cost and reliability that we need. Technologies like robotics and machine intelligence can expand beyond our human limits. These technologies will use similar three-layered control that operate in other industries. The local level is the sensing level, where the work is actually being done and responding, responding to sensory inputs. That feeds up to the control level, which is the planning system. It's developing the commands to act based on the inputs it's receiving from the local level. When the plan is complete, this level sends it to the supervisory level, which is the execution system that gives the commands to act. In machine intelligence systems, this happens almost simultaneously, faster than we can do it while constantly correcting and adjusting. And finally, regarding human factors, the machine systems will have to integrate these human factors into their programming. They're going to need to adapt to us and not us to them. If you remember the landmark report, The Air is Human, it's likely fixing those errors will require machines. Now let me set a framework for some of the terms I'll be using and what I mean by machine intelligence. This graphic from SAS does a great job of establishing that framework. Machine intelligence or machine learning occupies a sweet spot taking advantage of data mining and patent recognition. 
All this is enclosed within KDD, or Knowledge Discovery and Databases. This is what IBM's Watson is all about. Machine intelligence doesn't create new knowledge so much as finds the knowledge hidden in the data. It needs programming and structure. It incorporates algorithms to capture, store, index, and retrieve emerged data and orchestrate multiple subtasks like those three-layered control systems I just spoke about. Most importantly, it can be bounded. It can be designed for specific purposes like any other machine. We use the ro word robot look rather loosely in healthcare. Technically, a human-operated machine like the Da Vinci is not a robot, but we call it that anyway. So to distinguish between true autonomous machines, I'll use the term passive robot for human-operated systems like the Da Vinci and active robot for fully autonomous machines. And as you'll see, there are blends of both. So let's take a look at what is happening between 2015 and 2020. I'll start with logistics and then move to clinical innovation. You've probably heard of Xenix. It was made famous during the Ebola scare by a Texas hospital that used it to disinfect the room of the patient who had Ebola. It, em it emits a pulsed xenon ultraviolet light that can kill most microbes in about five minutes. The room is prepared, exposing all high-touch surfaces like raising bed rails and toilet seats. The machine is rolled in, plugged in, and two safety cones are placed, one that detects motion to shut it off and one to warn folks not to enter and let you, and let you know it's done. The operator then starts it and has 15 seconds to leave the room. The active aspect is the raising of the light and the actual emission of it. Great. These two transport systems are active robots. The Ethon Tug is an autonomous mobile robot that uses a program map of the facility and sensors to get where it needs to go. Swisslog is a European company that manufactures a similar system. They are used to transport medications, blood and tissue specimens, food and dirty tray return, clean and dirty linen, and trash using a variety of cart and cabinet attachments. Both are in use now and they're growing. For example, there are 25 tugs deployed across the 600,000 square feet of the new UCSF Medical Center in Mission Bay with backhauls designed for the use, as you can see in the picture on the lower left. The new Humber River Hospital in Toronto that is now under construction will be another good example of wide-scale deployment. The Nightscope K5 Autonomous Data Machine, as it's officially named, is an active robot. It can see, hear, feel, and smell. It has behavior analysis algorithms, predictive analytics, and can grab crowdsourced data if allowed or share its data to the crowd. It can send alerts or sound alerts if it is tampered with. The last time I checked, it is deployed at Microsoft's headquarters. The target market is companies and institutions with large campuses and parking areas and security companies. I think hospitals won't be far behind in adopting this. Many contract out to private security companies who always have a hard time retaining help, especially during off hours. At an entry price of $6.25 an hour, this will be hard to resist. Healthcare is woefully behind other industries when it comes to enterprise logistics, running entire operations via computers. But we're beginning to catch up. Care Logistics is a company dedicated to moving hospital logistics into a total enterprise management system. Right now, they are focused on getting as much efficiency as possible in patient throughput. The patient's care is managed through a control hub in the hospital, like the one pictured here, and all activity is monitored and updated constantly using care coordinators and live feeds. When ideally deployed, the care coordination team knows the status of every patient, every bed, every procedure, and what is coming through the ED, resulting in length of stay reductions of up to a day. While it's not yet connecting to all systems, I believe that will change as the system evolves. This is the active robotic pharmacy at UCFS Main Hospital. It's made by Swisslaw, the same company that produces one of the transport systems I showed you. Since 2010, it has assembled more than one and a half million pill packages of patient medications without an error. When an order is received, the robots pick, package, and dispense individual doses of pills. It assembles the doses onto a plastic ring, each of which contains all the medications for a patient for a 12-hour period. Nurses receive each of their patients' scheduled medications on the ring, which are barcoded and include the patient's name, list of the medications, and administration time. The other picture shows one of the three automated IV compounding stations for both regular IVs and hazardous compounds. 
hospital lab automation has been around for a while, and many hospitals have deployed certain aspects, if not all of them. These systems are configurable and scalable, and I don't think people view these systems as robotic, but they are. This image is from BD Kiestra showing their total lab automation system, and there are others. It's designed to speed up the process and take the human element out. Blood analysis is an $80 billion worldwide market, and innovation and competition has heated up considerably in the last few years. Many of you have heard of Theranos, a new technology that performs a complete array of tests from a very small sample of blood and delivers its results in hours. They are being placed in, in and near many Walgreens. It has competition, though. The image on the right is Redisense Diagnostics Point of Care device. It uses one drop of blood to perform a range of tests, including complete blood counts, A1Cs for diabetes, full lipids for heart disease, thyroid function, and renal function, among many other tests. They are aiming from the chronic disease market as managed in medical offices and ambulatory care centers. Both technologies could make phlebotomy workstations and a major portion of hospital lab work obsolete. And there is a robot phlebotomist I've just learned about under development called VBOT. It uses ultrasound to detect veins and autonomously pierces the skin and draws the blood. So that was the survey of the present state of logistical robotics. Now we'll turn our attention to clinical robotics and machine intelligence. Would it surprise you to know that true active robots and machine intelligence are providing care in hospitals right now? Whenever people are skeptical about healthcare robots, I point out the cyber knife. The machine and table work together automatically to position the patient for therapy and locks in when it registers the correct position. We probably don't think too much about it because not a lot of people come in contact with it. The treatment lasts a minute to a minute and a half and nothing mechanical penetrates the body. The encounter is brief, unremarkable, but it is an active robot nevertheless. And here is Da Vinci, the poster child of healthcare robotics. This machine is a passive robot that requires a surgeon with a lot of training to operate. It's been controversial for some specific procedures, but its effectiveness appears to be well accepted overall as long as the training is up to par. Many hospitals now have whole centers devoted to passive robotic minimally invasive surgery. The machine uses 3D imaging to better visualize the surgical field and can perform finer surgery than some current techniques and human ability allow. Most importantly, da Vinci's technology enables it to evolve to true active robotics. The latest version features automatic placement of the arms over the surgical site using a laser, and the arms and instruments themselves are getting smaller. Going forward, I will believe we'll integrate more active robotics into its system to stay ahead of the field and move to single port entry. Intuitive Surgical, the maker of da Vinci, is involved with the University of California in their efforts to advance active robotic surgical technology. I'll go into that a little more later on. We also have an active anesthesiology robot nicknamed Sleepy. It's being developed at McGill University and already has completed eight operations, including one with the da Vinci. The developers expect another two years of work and trials and then full commercialization within three years after that. This is a passive machine with an active feature that is key to its utility. Based on snake robotics, the active feature is that the endoscopic tube snake walks in each turn and passes that on to the next segment. In the image on the right, each turn marked with a red dot is locked in and stays that way as each link progresses. Instruments are passed through the tube. It is joystick driven, the surgeon is getting haptic feedback and can see via a high definition camera. No incisions are made and risk of infection is greatly reduced. Under current flexible endoscopes, you can reach many areas that you couldn't get to before because the endoscope would flex too much and not hold in place. You could turn this thing in a circle if you had to. Right now, it's being used in Europe on a limited basis for head and neck surgery with the aim to go after cardiovascular surgery. Here we have examples of hybrid passive and active machines used for hip and knee replacements. Think Surgical's machine on the left autonomously removes the bone where the implant will go according to a preset plan done in the 3D planning workstation. The burr is placed over the site and registers itself via preset location markers that correspond to the plan. Once that is confirmed, the surgeon starts the machine and it removes the bone exactly as planned. 
the surgeon always has stop and stop control, and there is a motion detection system that will stop it if the patient position changes. Everything else is done by the surgeon. Mako on the right is more like a robotic assistant. After planning and registering the area to be buried, the surgeon uses the burying device to remove bone and create the place for the implant. The machine makes sure the surgeon does not exceed the pre-planned bone removal. It physically prevents any attempts to go beyond the bounds of the planned bone removal. The image-guided autonomous robot was developed by Canada's Center for Surgical Invention and Innovation to autonomously sample and ablate breast cancer tumors. It's planned for commercial release in 2016. It can accurately biopsy a small lesion identified under MRI, it can ablate the lesion, and it can implant radioactive seeds to tag lesions for surgical removal. The next version of the system will be capable of performing sentinel node lymph biopsy for the staging of breast cancer, and they plan on moving the tech forward to lung, liver, and kidney disease. I couldn't resist including this machine. Artis is a robotic system that automatically harvests hair follicles for use in transplants. That is the active part. The surgeon does the actual transplant. The machine maps the hair removal area for what is needed for the transplant and then removes one to four individual hairs at a time, eliminating plug removal and the need for suturing. This is very, very precise work. While the surgeon still does the actual transplant, you have to wonder how far it will be before the machine does the entire process. Uh, and so you know, it's only indicated for male patent baldness right now. And here is REBA and REMAN. REBA stands for Robot for Interactive Body Assistance. It's the first robot that can lift up or set down a real human from or to a better wheelchair up to 135 pounds. Both can see, hear, feel, smell, and recognize emotion, and they have a soft body feel. Note the anime style to soften the effect of robots looking too human and risk being rejected by us. This is the uncanny valley problem, when a robot looks so much like us but are not quite like us that we tend to reject them as just creepy. The green color you see on Reman is deliberate. It's supposed to evoke the color of medical scrubs. These robots are designed for use in elder care facilities and properly configured home environments, but they can just as easily be used in hospitals. Commercial release is planned this year at an estimated price of $78,000. Japan, South Korea, and Thailand are way ahead of us in these types of robots. China is planning a big push, and so Japan and Korea are doubling their efforts in this area. There is a big caregiver robot race going on in Asia, and I'm sure we'll be seeing these in the U.S. at some point. The EICU is a great example of basic machine intelligence that proves its value every day. It receives input from the electronic health record, monitors, pumps, and visually, if needed, into a central control hub. Its algorithms continuously monitor all this data and alerts clinicians if a patient's condition worsens so they can intervene earlier. I've seen this in action, and it has proven itself time and again with reduced lengths of stays in ICU beds. And community hospitals are able to keep more acute patients rather than sending them to more expensive hospitals. Its capabilities continue to increase and can be used in other areas. The new hospital in Joplin, Missouri expanded its use to 10 regular acute care beds in addition to the EICU. Area here are a number of companies that are in the healthcare machine intelligence field in various ways. IBM's Watson is the best example and probably the deepest and most extensive system operating healthcare right now. It understands natural language, it generates hypotheses based on evidence, and learns as it goes by being taught by its users from prior interactions and by being presented with new information. But it is doing so within the bounds of its programming, not programming itself with new capability. It's being used by Memorial Sloan Kettering, and the New York Genome Center, the Mayo Clinic, and the Cleveland Clinic, among others. Century is more modest than Watson, but it has a big goal. Eliminate all preventable hospitalizations by being a wearable EICU. They're targeting Medicare Advantage and managed Medicaid plans as first customers. Twine Health is a collaborative platform for chronic disease management, shared planning and decision making, self tracking and monitoring. Its goal is to provide an optimal outcome in three months. Remedy Partners is a bundled care payment solution. The software integrates data from a variety of sources, provides patient assessments 
90-day care plans and site of care selection. It also provides quality measurement and reporting. Health InfoNet is named the EHR data gatherer. All hospital records are stored there. HBI is a data analytics firm out of California, and they were engaged to mine the records and predict emergency visits. So far, they've been right 74% of the time. Now, let's not forget about Google. DeepMind was bought by Google about two years ago. It combines the best techniques from machine learning and neurosciences to build powerful general purpose algorithms. And as you probably heard, Google just announced a partnership with Johnson & Johnson to develop robotic systems for the operating room. So, this is the first of three images that imagine diseases of the future. I've included a link to the whole series at the end of this webinar. You know, every action has a reaction, and these images do a great job in capturing the potential unintended disease consequences of the changes I'm talking about. This is a picture of Dr. Manhattan from the graphic novel The Watchman. He is imagined to be suffering from superintelligence-induced psychosis. In the graphic novel, he suffered a nuclear physics accident and evolved from a regular human to something approaching pure intelligence free from physical and temporal bounds and loss of humanity in the process. It conveys a serious point. We don't compute like machines, machines don't think like us. As we get more and more involved with using them, what kind of psychological issues will we be creating for ourselves? I don't have the answers, but plenty of folks are researching the subject. So let's move on to the five-year period beginning in 2020, keeping in mind that this timeline is my best estimate of when these technologies are coming online. So this is a screen image of Dr. Topol's book, The Creative Destruction of Medicine. The developments in telehealth are important because they have implications concerning what the hospital of the future is and is not. I've placed this section in the 2020 timeline because there are a lot of issues that need to be resolved regarding the technical integration of all the data that will come out of mobile and the acceptance and viable use of it by the medical establishment. Some believe it will all come together by 2020. Topo believes that one of the most important factors that will drive digital health forward in the next five years will be recruiting data scientists into the field. It's a key point and will affect how we educate and train our doctors going forward. For example, the University of Illinois recently announced a new school that integrates engineering and medicine. Dr. Topol's quote on the screen bears paying attention to. As we go forward with ever more sophisticated robotic and machine intelligence systems, will the human being and all of us get lost? That is exactly the same point being made in the Dr. Manhattan picture. So let's look at some examples of mobile and telehealth and keep in mind that these are just a sample of everything that is going on. The key to mobile health is the ability to sense and monitor all sorts of conditions and behaviors. On this slide is a list of various types of sensors and what they can measure and monitor. The list will keep growing along with our technical capabilities. Expect sensors that are drawn on you with enzyme-based inks, among other developments. There is another aspect of this we have to keep in mind. As the data streams grow, most of the data we will use for research and development will come from individual human beings not from animal studies in a lab. This will change how academic medical centers go about their research missions and will free many future researchers from the hospital and lab. It also raises questions about ownership of data, but that's a subject for another webinar to consider. Wearable sensors are now mainstream. The big companies in this field know they need to move up from providing wellness apps to being medical monitoring businesses if, if they are to make money. On the lower right is Fitbit's new Charge HR and Surge. The smaller Charge HR provides heart rate monitoring. The larger Surge has GPS, text viewing, and, con and can control music from your smartphone. It's a step up for them, but they are lagging far behind if they intend to get into the medical monitoring business. Samsung Sinban is a developer platform and not a consumer device. Based on their gear line, it has an accelerometer, gyroscope, ECG monitor, a, given, a galvanic skin response sensor, optical sensors for pulse and heart rate, and a skin temperature thermometer. The SIM band is an open data and open sensor platform. Samsung wants to be a medical data broker, not a device manufacturer. Apple has moved forward with its health kit and research kit services. Health kit is a repository for patient-generated health information like blood pressure, weight, heart rate, or anything the application developer can think to monitor. 
and Research Kit is open source app development for anything that a researcher wants to do that can be done via phone or the watch. There are a lot of hospitals that are working with Apple on pilot programs and probably more will join in. Unlike Samsung, Apple wants to be in both the device and data game. Coupled with Apple's partnerships with Epic and IBM's Watson, the possibilities here are vast. The FDA does not appear to be an obstacle for either device or algorithm approvals and has issued guidance on what can be advertised as a wellness device or a medical device. They are holding a reserve of their powers to regulate, though, and that has gotten the ire of the device developers, and there are bills in Congress to give developers more freedom without FDA oversight. The agency to watch is the Federal Trade Commission. They are looking into issues of who will hold monopolies on data, data generation, and transmission, because data is the coin of the realm. It's a question that will become increasingly important to answer as the sector evolves. Gartner is projecting that by 2020, the developed world's life expectancy will increase by a half year due to widespread adoption of wireless health monitoring technology. And they also think that by 2017, costs for diabetic care will be reduced by 10% through the use of mobile monitoring devices operated through smartphones. So will the tricorder trump all these devices? The R Health sensor pictured here is made by DMI. It won the second round in the Nokia challenge and is a finalist in the Qualcomm challenge. There are several other worthy devices competing for the prizes. Both challenges are seeking to create the ultimate sensor, the tricorder, as we've come to know it from Star Trek. According to DMI, the R Health sensor is a universal health sensor with capabilities to assess hundreds of different clinical lab tests in a single drop of blood or bodily fluid, and it has a detachable wireless vital sensor module for monitoring all vital signs. They're working on a version for routine consumer and clinical use now. Of course, there is the issue of connecting all these devices and the data coming from them into existing medical records and making sense of it all. Validic is an example of a company that wants to be the collector, integrator, and transmitter of all this data. This chat from the website demonstrates how they work in this space to try and bring it all together. Despite the big push in the last five years to digitize hospital and physician office medical records, there are still plenty of issues regarding interoperability between the two, and adding mobile data and devices complicates it even more. As we introduce more and more wearable and implantable monitors for medical use, keep in mind what Dr. Topol said. Interoperability needs to be enhanced, standards set, and interventions proven. There's a lot of interest in telemedicine kiosks, and it has gotten traction. The basic idea is you enter a kiosk, and it directs you to use an array of diagnostic devices. Typically, they have a pulse oximeter, blood pressure cuff, magnoscope, thermometer, autoscope, stethoscope, and scale. Self-check-in is done via touch screen, and you connect via video to a doctor or NP. Rite Aid is piloting the health spot kiosks and selected Ohio stores that connect to Cleveland Clinic and other hospitals in Ohio. And Florida Blue Cross is also using them in their, in their branded stores. Health Spot is attended, CSI is not, and both treat cleaning the interiors a little bit differently. What's interesting about this is that there's an ongoing lawsuit regarding CSI's patent that transmits data to the cloud. CSI is trying to protect that technology, and Health Spot is trying to co opt it. That gives you an idea of how important data and data transmission is to all things in mobile and telehealth. If necessity is the mother invention, is it possible that India has out kiosk to kiosk? Swazia Slate's answer is to bring it to the patient. The health worker brings the device to the patient and conducts any of 33 tests and can communicate with doctors via a computer. The slate can do a blood pressure, blood sugar, heart rate, ECD, ECG, temperature, urine tests, routine blood tests, among many others. It can also test for water quality, a very important factor in India. So finishing off this trip into mobile and telehealth is Molly, a virtual nurse avatar that is the face of Sensely's telemedicine solution. It's a program that is targeted to chronic care management in between doctor visits. It connects to medical devices in the home, like a blood pressure cuff, and collects data from the patient through image capture and responses to questions that the avatar asks. The program integrates all this into the medical record for action, and the patient can interact with real clinicians in real time if needed. The best way to understand this is to go to their website and watch it in action. 
in the interest of time, I won't be playing it, but you can imagine that avatar asking questions, recording your answers, and asking additional questions based on the answers while the camera records you the whole time. Vanderbilt University has invented a unique robotic device designed right now for epilepsy surgery, but it has possibilities for other types of brain procedures or anything a needle is used for. It uses a MRI-compatible nickel-titanium needle that operates like a mechanical pencil with straight and curved concentric tubes that allows the tip of the needle to follow a fixed curved path to reach the target area of the brain. The whole thing is powered by compressed air and is steered and advanced a millimeter at a time by the robotic platform and tracked by the MRI. The needle is inserted through the cheek and avoids drilling through the skull and using straight needles. This is Kid's arm. This is a robotic arm to help doctors perform certain procedures many times faster and with increased accuracy than if they were only using their hands. Right now this device can do three to five sutures autonomously. This is a development of the Center for Image Guided Innovation and Therapeutic Intervention in Toronto. It's connected to Canada Arm, the company that develops the arms on the space station, and McDonald, Detweiler, and Associates, the company that builds them. The first image is an early prototype with a biopsy instrument attached. The second image is a third generation device that is demonstrating suturing. It's being tested at Sick Kids, the hospital for sick children in Toronto, specifically around connecting veins and arteries to each other and to other surfaces. The testing involves camera-based tracking of tissue and desired suture points and automated positioning and application of sutures. It can suture 10 times faster than a surgeon. It's hard to tell in these pictures, but it is really small. So this is the second of Imagine Future Diseases and a very basic one, fear of robots. Notice that it bears a striking resemblance to artists and the cyber knife. The question is, will we reject active robots as part of the care team? We have easily accepted CyberKnife, and almost no one has a problem going to a CT or MRI bore. We are also comfortable with Da Vinci. How far will we humans allow ourselves to go when it comes to autonomous robotic testing, diagnosing, and treatment? How we design them, like the Japanese are doing, will matter, but more importantly, how we introduce them as part of the care team will matter even more. They will have to adapt to our physical and emotional human factors. According to a 2014 Pew Research study on the future of the Internet, the vast majority of 1900 expert Pews surveyed think that robotics and artificial intelligence will affect wide segments of our lives by 2025, especially in healthcare, transport and logistics, customer service, and home maintenance. Many believe this would be job creating, but our educational system is unprepared to educate and train the workforce that will be needed to take advantage of these technological developments. There are three items, increasing tactile feel, getting greater flexibility in robotic arms, and developing even smarter systems that will be key to increasing the use of active and minimally passive surgical robots. This microsurgical device is de being developed by NASA and the University of Nebraska in anticipation of long voyages to Mars. It's planned to be controlled by a surgeon on Earth in an active passive arrangement, but there is no reason it could not work autonomously on Earth. The image on the right compares the robot arms to a quarter, so you can really see how small this thing is. The surgical approach they are planning is to inflate the abdomen and slide it to the astronaut's body through a small incision in the belly button and perform emergency appies, coles, and emergency perforations of gastric ulcers, and also repair intra-abdominal bleeding due to trauma. The surgeon interface will have haptic devices and a monitor to provide visual feedback. The device will have to do certain things by command rather than direct surgeon control because of the inherent lag of remote operation over such long distances. The University of California Davis and Santa Cruz Center for Information and UC Berkeley Center for Automation for Medical Robotics are working on similar technology. Ignore the actual physical technology in the picture on the left because it is admittedly old and just a test bed for the software they are developing. Like the previous example, they are trying to overcome the time delays inherent in very long distance telesurgery by giving robots autonomous function. They do this by teaching particular surgical subtasks. The picture on the right shows it trying to suture on its own. 
Ideally, the remote surgeon orders the robot to perform each step of a surgery by specifying subtasks and parameters that are then performed autonomously by the robot, thereby avoiding the instability of the long-distance operator control. They are using a new statistical approach to robot warning called apprenticeship warning that has the potential to allow er robots to execute specific subtasks with superhuman performance in terms of speed and smoothness. The robot sensors record a set of human-guided surgical motions and its software smooths out and refines the motions and then gradually increases the speed of the motions. This type of wording is also being used in industrial robots like Baxter. So far, they have demonstrated this on a figure-eight motion and a two-handed knot tie after being trained by non-experts. At Berkeley, they have demonstrated autonomously cutting out a surgical patch designed to resemble a cancerous lesion. You can see from these last two examples in kid's arm that robotic soft tissue surgery is becoming faster, more reliable, and more autonomous. And it's all controlled by that three-layered IT system we talked about with the supervising surgeon exercising the highest level of control and the robot responsible for the two local levels. Intuitive Surgical gave Berkeley a Da Vinci machine, so to some extent they are working with them and obviously very interested in it because it is Da Vinci's future. Chasing all this are magnetically controlled instruments that are more powerful and even smaller. Both of these programs shown here aspire to be artificial intelligence. Eugene Guzman is an animated artificial intelligence that was able to fool the 2014 Turing test judges 33% of the time. That remains controversial, some dismissing it and some thinking it's a huge turning point for technology. IP Soft calls Amelia an artificial intelligence that can read and understand text, follow processes, solve problems, and learn from experience. It is designed to replace humans in a wide range of low-level jobs. It still sounds like machine intelligence to me, but they really, really want to clearly pass the, the Turing test. I may have placed Amelia too far out in the timeline because it's already being field tested. It's been used on help desk, procurement processing, financial trading, operations support, and so forth. Let's just move on a little bit from this. Gartner projects that by 2017, managed services offerings that make use of programs like Amelia will drive a 60% reduction in the cost of services. And IPSoft, the makers of Amelia, have further plans to embed it into robots, allowing it to take advantage of their mechanical functions. And we're going to go a little bit quickly just to cover nanotech. Uh, what you're seeing here is called micro grippers. They were developed at Johns Hopkins, and they are sub-miniature, not quite nano-level robotics. It's a, these little grippers are autonomously activated by the body's heat, which causes those fingers to close on cells. They're really designed for taking biopsy samples, and they're drawn out of the body uh, through an or orifice with a magnet. Typical biopsies, you take 30 to 40 pieces of tissue, Introducing these, and you can see how many you can put in that little uh, glass jar, they would, there would be swarms of these, and they would take many more samples across a wider area, and that would increase the accuracy of the biopsies and probably dis discover more disease and extent of the disease. This has already been successfully tested on animals. On the left is a picture of an actual nano robot. It was created in Japan, and they have already successfully performed a single cell puncture using that needle-like device extending from the main structure. On the right-hand side is a rendering of DARPA, the Department of Defense's research arm, and their venture into nanotech. They have two research programs going on right now. The first is focused on diagnostics. They launched that in 2012, and the second, launched in 2013, is focused on treatment. They are looking at treating infections caused by multi-drug resistant organisms and, condu and conditions due to traumatic brain injury within the body using this nanotech. And here's another example. This was developed at North Carolina State. This is a graphene strip that's one atom thick and it delivers anti-cancer drugs. They bind the cancer drug to the graphene strip through those peptide links and then they, in, then they insert that directly into the disease cells where that drug is targeted. There are a lot of examples of this kind of nanotech, and I, you, can't, you can't show everyone. You, it's just daily I see new, um, I see new uh, pieces of this. So the last in our series of diseases of the future, and this one de 
depicts nanotoxicological shock where normally healthy human beings pick up nanoparticles, react badly with them, and go into shock. The question this raises is how will we prevent nanotech from entering the environment and what effect will it have if it does escape? Nanomaterials are being developed for all sorts of industrial and commercial uses, not just for healthcare. A track record of preventing any sort of chemical from entering the environment is not good, so we need to be acutely aware of how we prevent the same from happening with nanotech. We simply don't know what could happen on a wide scale if these emerging materials were released into the environment. So as I'm listening, this has been very fascinating, and I'm watching some of the emails coming in on commenting on it. One of the things that was so important here was, what does this mean for the future of the hospital? And I think that uh, as we look at all the dots, how do they come together? Because as we're working with other clients, we're working on the wonderful transformation that's going to happen with autonomous cars. And you talked about some wonderful things in terms of how we're going to get to know what's healthy and not. I can tell you afterwards about some stuff that's going on in contact centers to stay on top of the treatment and how to keep people compliant. So it goes from the big to the small. So let me ask you to Tell us a little bit more about what the future of the hospital is going to look like as these all come together, because you've got a great image here. Okay, great. Thank you. So my view of this is that the hospital of the future is really more than one type of facility. And I've broken it out into, into four quadrants. There is an intense acute care hospital, and that's what I'll concentrate uh, my time on for the remainder of this webinar. An intense ambulatory care center, which will have many similar functions that occur in, in the acute care hospital a telehealth facility, and an urban and rural critical access hospital, which is a, another subject altogether. And understand that these are not, don't have to be four separate standalone things. They can mix and match depending on the markets that folks are in. So the ICH constantly monitor, measure, and adjust activity in the facility from a variety of optical, sonic, and wavelength detectors and sensors and direct feeds from equipment. The information includes data from implanted, wearable patient biometric devices, data from autonomous machines, current volumes, staff locations, supplies, equipment locations, ambient conditions and energy use, and projected volumes. In short, all the data the IACH's machine intelligence needs to constantly adjust and ensure maximum efficiency in the use of all resources, anticipate future need, and move the patient efficiently through the treatment plan and ensure just-in-time resource consumption and staffing. Routine functions will, will be replaced with purpose-designed autonomous robots and machine intelligence. These machines will do most of housekeeping, dietary, pharmacy, care assistance, central sterile processing, and business and maintenance functions. General labs will no longer exist. Specialized robots will be used routinely in the operating room and other clinical areas, replacing some physicians, nurses, and technical specialists. Diagnosis and treatment plans will be developed by the IACH's machine intelligence. Doctors and nurses in the ICH will be experts at deploying the vast amount of data and robotic capabilities to cure and repair patients in the shortest amount of time. Most patient rooms will be multifunctional, enabling a wide variety of procedures, imaging, and, la and levels of care to be conducted in the room. The patient, when not un undergoing active treatment, will be able to access any number of room features that can connect him or her with family or loved ones, the treatment plan and overall health record, active memory stimulation, and entertainment. The room will monitor the patient's condition, respond to requests, adjust the environment, and provide a machine intelligence generated counselor to converse with that knows the patient's condition and history and is programmed to be empathetic. That counselor may have followed the patient from a home care environment and if not, could follow the patient to home care. Operating rooms per se won't exist, and this is the area where I, where I get the most pushback from my colleagues, and rightly so. The notion of individual rooms will give way to very large spaces where procedures are performed. This wide open space will configure and reconfigure automatically to accommodate multiple scheduled and unscheduled procedures. The operating space will accommodate autonomous or operator-assisted robotic surgical equipment Imaging equipment will be integrated directly into the space and not be hybridized. One of the biggest developments will be the use of hologram images of the operating field. These will be overlaid exactly onto the patient and will guide the surgery. Data readouts will be within the hologram field. 
advances in sterilization and other methods to isolate multiple operations going on in the same space will accommodate these changes. Necessary pox, biologics, implants, and surgical equipment will be custom made in the OR space through a variety of machines. And anesthesia will move to electric cerebral cortex manipulation instead of a drug injection. Surgical times will be halved. Teaching and research will be dispersed. Singular enterprises built on a triad of research, teaching, and care will struggle with maintaining that mission as teaching vendors move to other types of facilities. Many IACHs will simply provide the most advanced care possible while research and some teaching are conducted elsewhere. Medical and nursing schools and GME programs will have to change curriculum to keep up with the demand for the specialized knowledge. A new healthcare workforce will emerge trained in the programming, deployment, and maintenance of machine intelligence and autonomous robots. Facility designs will change substantially to accommodate machine intelligence and autonomous robotics. New service pathways that keep machines out of public view will be created along with docking, storage, and maintenance spaces. Designs focused on grand hotel-like features, expansive lobbies, and other visitor spaces will no longer be financially feasible or desirable because of being admitted to an ISCH will be a very unusual event in a person's life, and if they are admitted, their length of stay will be very short. The number of beds in public spaces will be greatly reduced. Designs that feature efficiency and enhance human-machine interaction will be the norm. A new generation of staff, digital natives who are weaned on the integration of machines into their lives, will not object to co-working with machine intelligence, however manifested. Designs will need to ensure this coexistence in such a way that it preserves the humanity of the place. This is more an imperative for the workforce than for the patient. And that concludes the webinar. And I've left you with some uh, sources that I urge you to um, access. Some are um, very entertaining, and I think you'll enjoy them. Thank you. Let me uh, thank you all for coming today and tell you a little bit about the next webinar. It's quite interesting listening to Donald talk about what he sees uh, coming. And the next webinar is really about how to take what we've always done and transform its value in new ways. And so I would urge you to come along May 15th when we speak about how to turn the cost center of a call center into a revenue generator. But the bigger picture here is how are we going to help people get the care they need, when they need it, where they need it, in a fashion that's most accessible to them. I'm also thinking about hospitality. And Donald, I have several clients who are bringing in hospitality uh, experts to help them create better experiences. And as I'm listening to you, I'm wondering where that's all going to fit. So as we wrap up our at our 1 o'clock closing, our presenter today is Donna Belfew. He's available for additional conversations, and I give you his uh, email here and urge you to continue. I want to thank you for coming, and you certainly can always get a hold of us. What we will be doing is turning this into an audio PowerPoint that we'll be sending out next week so you can share it, and we hope you enjoyed it. Thanks again. We'll see you next month, and appreciate you coming. Bye-bye now.